So this is this is a wake up call, and it's not an easy one. And I respect anybody who can even begin to walk around this. I'm not asking you to believe everything I'm saying, but I am asking you, no matter what your viewpoint is on the subject, even if you have a viewpoint, to walk around this and consider the things I'm saying today. If we don't get this right, we're going to fail. My name is Reed Summers, and I'm here with Marshall Vian Summers, my father, to share with you a conversation between he and I on the topic of understanding contact and our world's emergence into a larger universe of intelligent life. So again, thank you for being here. Over the series of live streams with Marshall, we're exploring uh, the bigger picture of our present reality in the world and the bigger picture of where the world is going and how this is connected to each of us and the calling for us to discover our own participation and contribution in this bigger picture and the steps we need to take to get there. So if that feels like something that's important to you, thank you for being here and for being a part of these conversations as we go both higher but also deeper because the, the bigger picture reality beyond us is very much connected to the, to the deeper picture within us at, at our core. Uh, the two are intrinsically in communication. So uh, we're going to be talking more about that. Tonight, we're going to explore the reality of contact, the possibility that our world is part of a larger universe and that we are destined to make contact with that universe and that that may already be happening in the world today. Contact may already be underway. And again, with me is Marshall, uh, my father, who has spent over 40 years focused on this topic, giving much of his life and work to really unveiling uh, the implications of this contact, what it will mean for our world as a whole, and what it most deeply means for us individually who are alive in the world at this time. We are in the world when the world makes its biggest step out into the universe, when really the biggest event in human history takes place, which is our contact with other forms of intelligent life. And Marshall has written and spoken extensively on what this means for us at a spiritual level and at the level of our life calling. So uh, with me tonight is Marshall. Thank you Good. for being here. Great to be here. And uh, tell us a little bit about yourself and your journey with this topic and what, your, what the essential message is about mm -hmm. our mm -hmm. contact with other forms of intelligent life. Well, over the past 40 years, I have covered many topics in my work. But this topic I'll be speaking of tonight seems to be very central to the direction I was given and that I've chosen to follow. A topic that is a difficult topic in the world because most people don't really want to talk about it or have a lot of views about it that aren't really very helpful. So it's been a real challenge to follow this invisible light that has kept me going through many stages of development. But I'm very blessed to have spoken with many people who are connected to this subject of contact, experiencers, researchers, everyone, over the course of this time. So it's given me an opportunity to see the nature of this phenomenon and also the difficulties in responding to it clearly and objectively. My task overall is to bring a larger force of work and revelation to the world about the current condition of the world, the future of humanity, and the future of humanity in space. And at the core of this is humanity's emergence into a greater community of intelligent life in the universe, what I call the greater community, a larger arena of life about which we know almost nothing at all, but which is now impacting our world in many ways and will continue to do so as we proceed. So in this broadcast with you tonight, I'd like to paint a broad picture of what the meaning of this contact is and some of its dimensions. It's a very big subject, and I will not be able to express everything that's important. But the things I will speak of are things that are really important in clarifying this picture and separating it from the tremendous amount of confusion and controversy around this subject and perhaps give us a much clearer view a much more direct understanding of who is here, why they're here, and how we should respond. 
Yeah. So, so Marshall, I think uh, as people listen and begin to think about this, they're thinking contact. So contact with what, with who, and, and in what light? You know, there are many mm -hmm. opinions and beliefs and fears mm -hmm. and, um, you know, uh, storylines in our societies and cultures about right. contact. So can you tell us, in your view, what is the nature of this contact? Who are we making contact with? Well, our contact represents the presence of foreign races from the universe, physical beings, physical races, who are interfering in our world, present in our world, and participating in our world in a way beyond our awareness or understanding, certainly here without our permission, and carrying on activities um, that have become more visible to us over time. In fact, millions of people around the world have witnessed these craft in our skies. And some people have had direct contact uh, with these visitors themselves. So it is really an important and really big event. The forces that are here in our world are very small in number, but possess tremendously advanced technology. They do not represent a military force, or have not demonstrated that in any way. But they definitely have their own agenda in being here. And something that is important for us to begin to discern, and we can begin to discern it not only from the evidence of their activities and the experiences of people who have experienced them, but also some things that we know ourselves innately about what visitation, or what I call in this case intervention, really means. Because in the whole history of humanity, we've had intervention from races, nations, and races upon one another, particularly advanced nations upon more primitive or native races. We certainly have a clear history of what that has been like and what that has produced. So we're now at a new threshold of understanding. And I think we have to realize that our human logic, even our human science, cannot really encompass the meaning and the reality of what we're experiencing now. Uh, the universe is not a human universe, certainly. And we are but a very small part of it. In fact, you could say the world that we live in, as beautiful and magnificent as it is, is only a grain of sand on a beach as far as the eye can see. That's how big this universe is. But we're not dealing with the big, big universe. We're dealing with the local universe. Those who are aware of our existence, those who have an interest in our world or our future, those who are investing themselves in being here without our awareness or understanding. So this is what we have to face. And we have tools now to begin to face this and to prepare for it in an intelligent manner. We have to accept that this is not a visitation. We have not invited these forces here. They have not asked permission to be here. We have not set guidelines for them being here, as would be required of us as a host. Uh, they're working with and acting with impunity in our world. Uh, they're transgressing all the boundaries of nations and security and everything within countries and between countries. So they're here with their own agenda, and they don't seem to care what we think about it. So this is clearly an intervention. To try to make it a visitation uh, is really to imbue it with our own values and interpretation, which really the reality of this does not demonstrate. So it is important for us to take a very cautionary approach now, and I'm going to take that approach, because that should always be the first approach to any kind of new reality that you're facing, particularly one for which you do not have an understanding, for which you do not have experience, which you can't really define for yourself very easily. So life is a cautionary process if it's undertaken wisely. Mm -hmm. And we certainly have to exercise this caution, which many people do not do. But we are the native peoples of this world facing intervention. We're facing foreign races who possess technology far beyond our own. This is not a fulfillment of our dreams. This is not a rescue mission from afar to save us from ourselves. There's no evidence to support that at all. So we should never assume that we are so important in the universe that other races will go out of their way to try to rescue or save us from ourselves. That is not the way we should approach this, particularly at the outset. It is a remote possibility, but the evidence of their presence here over many decades has not been supporting that in any kind of visible way. Yeah. 
Marshall, I'd like to share a passage from um, one of your works called Entering the Greater Community. Mm -hmm. And so we'll bring this up on screen here. As humanity stands at the brink of a declining world, a world of declining resources and growing economic and political upheaval and instability, it is the perfect time for intervention. Mm -hmm. And so to go back to this topic of intervention, mm -hmm. why is it the perfect time? And, and really, what is, what is this intervention and what is it here to do? Because I think yes. that, that pairs, obviously, with the time that we're in in the world. Well, this is a very important question, you know, and as we face a world now of declining resources, and a heating planet, it's producing all kinds of problems for us on a large scale. Um, the divisions between nations are now becoming more enhanced. We have a major war going on in the world currently, which is a very tragic situation. I mean, clearly, if you look at the history of intervention in our world between, say, European powers and native races, those powers were able to overcome much larger nations, partly because those larger nations were in internal conflict. And the intervening forces were able to take advantage of that conflict by recruiting natives, the you know one of the opposing forces, to begin to undermine the existing power of, say, the Mayas and the Aztecs and things like this. So clearly, if we're in disarray, we're much more subject to intervention, and that intervention can express itself much more freely because we're so distracted with our own difficulties and problems, and we're not paying attention to the presence of other forces who are here to take advantage of that for their own benefit. I'd like to back up a little bit. Um, you, you talked about what you call the greater community, mm -hmm. which I believe, you know, and I understand to mean the universe at large. So can you talk about what is this greater community and what does intervention from that greater community mean? Okay. Well, the word greater community doesn't imply unity or... Um, they're all one big family. <laughs> it just encompasses the vast scope, in this case, of intelligent life in our local universe. Uh, we don't need to consider other dimensions at this point. We don't need to consider far reaches of the universe. We're having to deal with what's immediately around us in our circumstances, uh, encountering life beyond our borders. We're very restricted in discovering this, of course. We do not have the technology to visit other inhabited worlds. And we can only witness the presence of those who are here today. And um, there are certain elements of the deeper government that have been doing that for a long time who will not reveal to us what they know. And I can begin to understand why this might be the case. But that's another story. <laughs> but the rapid depletion of our resources is setting us now in training to become ever more unstable and to foment long-standing conflicts or disputes between nations. Certainly, the competition for resources is the most fomenting act thing for war there is. In fact, you could even say most wars are a competition for resources. Land, resources, all the things that are involved in that, because all nations need resources. And um, so we're in a very turbulent time in our world. It's going to become more turbulent. So intervention now recognizes this is a mineral-rich, biologically rich world, which is rare in the universe of barren planets. Worlds like ours are probably extremely rare and highly valued. The fact that we as a native race are destroying this world at a rapid rate, destroying its value, its resources, its diversity of life. I mean, diversity of life is phenomenal, uh, phenomenally important to other races too, for many, many reasons. And the rapid decline of our resources and the advent of nuclear weapons, those two things, has brought intervention here in its more mature phase because the world has been visited throughout our history, but not like it's occurred since World War II. We're in a unique era of intervention now, and it has been unceasing since it got started in that great world conflict. So, Marshall, can you tell us then, what are these intervening races doing? What, what is the nature mm -hmm. of, of their activity in the world? Well, they appear to have four fundamental, fundamental activities, activities of the intervention. The first is to establish a clandestine active presence in the world. That means they're here, we may witness their craft, we may discern their presence, but we really have no access to who they are, what they're doing, how they communicate with each other, 
or how they move through the world. Your whole movement in the world is kept secret. The second era, the second part of their influence is to establish certain influence over certain leaders in the world in the area of governance, religion, and industry. Not all leaders, but certain leaders. And within that, to seek um, to seek compliance and support from these leaders, promising them wealth, maybe world dominance, saying, we can give you everything you cannot give yourself. We can solve all your problems, and we can help you overcome your adversaries. And of course, this is important for industry leaders to become the dominant industry in the world or religious leaders to become the dominant religion in the world. So this is all playing us against each other. This is a classic intervention thing of turning elements of society against one another. Divide and conquer, divide and conquer strategy. The third one, which is really interesting and much more difficult to discern, is to influence religious thinking and impulses, particularly amongst people who are disaffected from establishing world religions, who are now seeking spiritual meaning, purpose and value in other ways. And many of them have fallen under the influence, either directly or indirectly, of the intervention, to think the intervention itself is the religious force that is coming to the world to unite the world and to restore the true meaning of religion that it seems to have been lost amongst the discord and the um, conflict between existing traditions. And the fourth one, which is really hard to deal with, is taking individuals against their will off planet, subjecting them to very dangerous kinds of tests and programming them to become advocates and supporters of the intervention. And you see this, the evidence of this everywhere, how people could be so believing in something that's never really proven itself to be of value for anything, but they're really committed. And there's no reason for them to be committed other than something that's happened to them internally that has fixated themselves on this foreign presence in the world that they believe is here to uplift us both materially, technologically, and spiritually. So this is active in the world today. It's the evidence of the intervention's impact upon individuals because they need individuals to speak for them and to support them and to help them carry out their activities. It's Marshall, a wild if thing. I can, if I can um, interrupt briefly, I want to go back to something you just said, which is, you, I think you called it the classic strategy of intervention, mm -hmm. which is this divide and conquer. Yes. Um, approach, which is very familiar to us in our own history. If you look at the history of colonization, mm -hmm. uh, of empire formation, this is what they do mm -hmm. when they make contact with native peoples. That's and right. I want to share this other passage sure. from the mm -hmm. same work uh, called Entering the Greater Community. Mm -hmm. I think it speaks right to it. Good. Having lost faith in human leadership and institutions, people will look to other powers in the universe to guide them. Mm -hmm. believing fervently that a beneficial force will come here to restore and to save humanity from itself. It is this expectation, <clears throat> this desire, however unconscious it might be, that the intervention will utilize for its own purposes. And I wanted to bring mm -hmm. this out because, because of this first statement about losing faith in human leadership mm -hmm. and institutions, yes. which seems to be just almost the story of the day, yeah. you know, division within countries, pol breakdown of democracies and mm -hmm. democratic processes, um, just the wild spread of conspiracy theories, almost about everything. That's right. And it seems almost strange that that is taking place, possibly alongside the uh -huh. arrival That's right. of advanced, intelligent, strategic forces who would use those very same, th these very strategies That's right. of promoting division and distrust. So. How do you view that today? When you look out on the world, how do you view this this this, this almost in, this pandemic of distrust, which is just almost everywhere, yes. and the presence of this intervention? Well, first of all, we're living in an age of pessimism, which is very different than you could say an age of optimism, which may have been a part of the, the former century, the latter part of the former century. But the intervention's power is influencing people's thinking and behavior, thus behavior. Its power is not 
conquering people by force. This is a primitive idea. We're, we're still in a Star Wars mentality. That's not what's going on in the universe around us. The competition is for influence. And they can influence people who are vulnerable to their persuasion. And many people are making themselves very vulnerable to this, by the way. And there's a breakdown in trust. In trust in our traditions, our way of life, the value and integrity of our leadership. And it's polarizing people's people and groups within nations, between nations. And we're leading nations into almost intractable conflicts like we see in the war in Ukraine right now. Why is Russia committing itself to something that will ultimately destroy its economy and alienate itself from much of the rest of the world? See, this is there's something very strange going on now that's leading leaders to do very unwise and destructive things. So they, they will encourage our conflict between ourselves but not to the detriment of the natural world. They want to preserve that because that is the value of the world. But they cannot live in our world. They cannot breathe their atmosphere. They can't even tolerate the biological diversity. So they need us to work for them. They can't live here. They can't breathe their atmosphere. They can't tolerate the biological hazard of living in such a biologically diverse world, a world not of, not their world. So. They need us to work for them, to carry on their activities. It's manipulation. And um, many people are falling under its persuasion. And I understand why. I understand the nature of distrust. There's been a lot of failure in governance. There's been a lot of corruption in governance. I mean, of course, there's always been corruption in governance. But somehow this is now exploding this part of our reality into such a large specter that is dominating people's awareness and attention. And then conspiracy theories, in my opinion, are really largely fueled by the intervention itself. I mean, you, you think America is corrupt and well, she go live in other countries. She go visit other countries. I mean, yes, there are, there are legitimate complaints, absolutely. But to think this is this is a conspiracy to take over the world by some cabal of industrial leaders. There's no evidence to support that. Yeah, it seems like it's it's the extreme nature of of those positions that people are taking. It's yes. not that there isn't corruption. It's not yes. that there are problems. Absolutely. But it's it's that you would you would not only give up on this country, but even propose civil war within this country yes. or or turn against its fundamental institutions right. completely. That, that, it's the extreme nature of people's response, which and, seems... And that is the amplification that the, the intervention can bring to our pre-existing conflicts, discord, and lack of trust or discouragement. I mean, in the changing environments of the world with climate change and contraction of vital resources, I mean, it's leading people into financial crisis all over the world. Um, it's going on everywhere right now. And so that creates a level of tension and disunity that's really big. I mean, so the intervention knows this. It knows we are creating this environmental condition for itself. It's probably happened countless times in the universe. Where races do something destructive to their environment, and then living there becomes increasingly difficult, resources decline, and they have to seek engagement with other races in the universe, which probably is the end of their sovereignty as a world. There's many aspects of this, but I think we need to see that the, the environment is ripe for intervention. And the other reason it's ripe for intervention is we have created a basic technological foundation for a foreign race to use. This is why it didn't happen 100 years ago. This is why it didn't happen in ancient times. We are creating, mostly from our own means, but maybe with some of their, some of their assistance along the way, a technological foundation that they can utilize. We didn't do that for them, but it is the byproduct of what we've created for our own uses. But it can be useful to them. And that is another reason why intervention is going into a mature phase right now. Our world has been probably observed for centuries, uh, but the potential for the kind of intervention that is being sought requires that we build a foundation for it. 
They're not getting resources from another world to build something here. They don't know how to build anything in our world. They don't even know how to use our world. So, and um, it sets up a dynamic that's going on behind the scenes. So, really in the dark. Obsessed with ourselves personally, obsessed with our ideas, obsessed with our conflicts, obsessed with world conflicts, declining economic situation, declining resource situation, very big things. Perfect time for intervention to come to begin to work its process of disillusion in the world. Divide and conquer. They can do this without firing a shot. They have this mental skill to do this, and we become more vulnerable to this as we become more depressed, more anxious, more angry, more frustrated. So this is a, their window of opportunity. And I will say one thing about how governments are responding. The part of our government that knows about this is way secret, way deep. It's not your elected officials. It's not your president. It's not your Congress. Way deep. To respond to this intervention and try to create a technological response to it. This is not only a response to intervention, it's also a technological race. Whoever can claim and develop this technology will have dominance in the world. Technological dominance in the world. So that's a mighty big, two, two mighty big incentives for there to be a secret effort beyond human awareness to try to counteract the intervention, but also to gain its technology for our own purposes or any other country. And we have competitors in this. Surely we have competitors. So I want to bring that into view because this is why the government isn't telling you the truth, particularly certain parts of the military who have the most experience with this, uh, are not willing to come forth and say what they know and what they see and what they're doing. So Marshall, if I can pause us both for a moment and kind of recap for those for those viewing, because there's been a lot of there's a lot of factors and forces at work here. So yes, basi the, the basic message here is that we're part of a larger universe of life you call mm -hmm. the greater community, mm -hmm. and we've reached a stage in our world's evolution and the conditions of our world that has brought a f some form of intervention, yes. non-military yes. intervention but which is aggressive and, and self-seeking nonetheless. It is aggressive, yes. Okay. And this, this, there's one intervention, there's not multiple. Um, and, and like the passage I shared, people may want a saving force or some sort of rescuing extraterrestrial mm -hmm. presence, mm -hmm. but that is not here, is that correct? That's right. Okay. And there's a reason that it's not here. I mean, any freedom-loving nation would not intervene with humanity at a time of this kind of discord, because in order to help us, they'd have to take over the world. And no freedom-loving nation or race in the universe will do that. It wouldn't even want to do that. But even would, would never achieve their goal of supporting human freedom and unity in the world. They'd literally have to take over the whole world. And so all a freedom-loving race can do is share with us their wisdom. Humanity, we need to share things with you you cannot see being on the surface of your world that you need to know that you could not know otherwise. And... That has been given to us now. And so we have to be prepared for something that we've never had to deal with before. And why this looks like the greatest challenge to humanity is also a great gift because nothing else will unite the fractured nations and cultures of the world. Beyond all the history of conflict, history of grievance, competition for resources. There is something that can unite us, and only a threat from beyond can do that. Without that, we will decline into ever-growing competition, conflict, and war. That's the great risk. So there is an imperative to share about, for me to share this with you, for that reason as well. It's not just that we have a problem with intervention is that the problem of intervention itself is probably the only thing that can unite humanity because everybody's at risk. No nation will benefit from this if the intervention is successful. 
No nation will prevail over another if the intervention is successful in gaining control of this world. We will become a client state of some foreign power over which we have no control. And you know, one other thing that we need to know about the universe is freedom is really rare there. Even the freedoms that we enjoy, parts of our world at least, very rare in the universe. That's another story I don't have time to go into at this point. But it is a factor here because we are a freedom-loving people, though we struggle to attain that freedom and maintain it. But that freedom is rare in the universe. And those who are intervening in the world today do not know this freedom, do not practice this freedom, and do not promote this freedom. What they tell the people they take, what they tell the people they capture, well, they'll tell them whatever they want. They want to hear, the people want to hear. We're here to save you. We're here to rescue you. We're your spiritual seniors. Uh, we were in the world before you. We're coming back to reclaim. All these kind of narratives are being passed on to people who are captured. But it's all deception, every bit of it. So we have to become very sober about this. And I, this is very hard to face. This is very hard to deal with. But you have to start somewhere. And we have a deeper spiritual power within us that gives us the strength to face this and the ability to respond to it effectively within ourselves as individuals and collectively as we unite with other people to face this together. So, if that were not the case, our story would be over. And there'd be no point in trying to rescue the human family in a universe uh, such as we live in. But there is. There is a great promise. In fact, if humanity is to grow into a larger, united world of people who are competent and responsible and cautious regarding their interactions with the universe around them, then we're going to have to go through something like this. And that's why the first great challenge for us is a great challenge of this magnitude. So, yes, scary, yes, but think of the power of this to unite people beyond their existing conditions, if they're aware of it, if they see what is happening. So this is a great challenge. But you know, all great challenges start with poor odds. You know, nothing invented ever started out with any assurance of success. But this is pretty much a imperative, I think. And, you know, also great challenge brings out greater things in us. In Absolutely. People. And I, I know a large part of your work is about that, which I think is, is really interesting and worth going into. So we have this, this rather dark picture about intervention uh -huh. with these four activities that you mentioned, um, very covert, very behind the scenes, and very overwhelming probably for some of those listening. Like, oh my God, I've, I've got to start thinking about this now when life is already pretty big for all mm -hmm. of us. But there's also an opportunity here, and, and not just an opportunity maybe to unite as a world or to mm -hmm. overcome differences, but an opportunity for individuals to respond in, oh, some, in some other way. So where does this bigger issue and this rather dark reality, how does that come back home to us uh -huh. individually and, and the opportunity for us in, right. in all of this? Well, we don't become great by accident and we don't become wise by accident. And we have a greater strength within us that we maybe have experience from time to time in terms of what, how it's guided us to do or not to do. But we have the power to protect the world from this intervention. They're a small force. They have no control over what happens on the ground. It's, we manage the world. We can live in this world. And they can only, given the rules of in intervention in, in our local universe, this is something that is a gift given to me to understand, Conquest cannot be undertaken in a highly inhabited part of space in which we live. Who would ever know we're living in a highly inhabited part of space? Well, we don't know that. And so intervention has to be persuasive. It has to make us want it to be here. It has to make us agree to its presence. You see what I'm saying? It can't just take us by force. It doesn't have that force. It doesn't have that force. So... It's our response to its presence and our response to each other in light of its presence that can make all the difference in bringing forth this greater strength and determination we all have, 
however undiscovered, however unexpressed it might be, it's there. So a large part of my work is restoring to people their power, integrity, and determination in life. And I don't mean power and determination to make money or to be a superstar in the world, but to have the strength to guide your life according to what you know to be true and to recognize things in the world that you can serve given what you, who you are and what you have to give. Because the world has many, many needs and many different levels of service. Without this, the world will decline and the outcome becomes ever more predictable as we go forward. So this is a big time to be in the world but from my point of view, this is why you're here. I don't think there's any accident you're here without this greater context. That's part of your deeper nature, not your personal nature, not your desires and your hopes and your plans and what you prefer and what you don't like. This is much deeper. You have a deeper nature. It's not who you are. You're not some blind consumer out there just, you know, dictated by commerce and politics, I mean, there is a deeper part of you. And this is what has to come forward in us as a core response to a challenge of this nature. In fact, it has to come forward from us from a challenge, all the challenges in the world. <clears throat> or we'll just fight with each other endlessly. And the forces of dissonance are in the world. This is the intervention. It's not some spiritual, demonic thing. It's a physical force that's here with a purpose and a plan. So, and yet you also say so often that um, it is a physical reality, but it has major spiritual implications, or okay. connections. And what are those then? For well, the, the spiritual connections is to reach this deeper strength within us. We've been sent into the world to be at the world at this time under these conditions. So, if you really want to know who you are, rather than just calling yourself a spiritual being, or you know, praying to a deity or a saint then you have to come into connection with this deeper power and reality within you. That is our spirituality. This is spirituality beyond the level of religion and religious discord and religious contradiction or religious competition. This is our core spirituality. At the basis of all the world's religions is this spiritual emphasis. And its emphasis is on peace, is on restoration, is on forgiveness, and is on contribution. And the more you become engaged with this aspect of yourself, the more your personal life begins to clear up, the more you become free of addiction or free of habits of, you know, destructive behavior, your life begins to become strong, determined, and you feel inner direction. Because God is going to move you from the inside out. There's no spiritual force from the outside that's going to come in and make everything right. God works through us from the inside out. That redeems us and enables us to do things we wouldn't do otherwise. We all, we'd all want to go to the beach and just stay there and be happy. But that's not why we came here. There's no fulfillment there. There's no satisfaction. There's no self-respect there. You're never going to be okay with yourself if you give yourself to things like that. So, in a way, the, the exigencies of our time are really redemptive if we can respond to them correctly. Yeah, that's 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 such an amazing and, and important perspective on contact, which is I find such a solid topic, and it's it's uh -huh. both ridiculed and derided in in the mainstream, and yet when you when you get into that topic matter, you find people who have cherished beliefs and wild views and, and notions about who's here, oh, yeah. and so to view this as an evolutionary event. With as a, and as a major opportunity to reconnect to our core being, mm -hmm. I think is is a very healthy and productive place to land right. with this topic. Right. Instead of to be a believer or to be a skeptic, right. to right. be enamored with it or to be aversive with it. Uh -huh. And I know many people have that experience around this topic, mm -hmm. unfortunately, when really this is an event of life. I mean, oh, this is human totally. evolution taking place. This is the next big yeah. thing. And it shouldn't be either hated or loved, wanted exactly. or denied. It, exactly. It is life happening. And yes. it's and I think for those watching, you're probably watching because this topic means something to you. And I think what you're saying, Marshall, is it means something to this deeper part of you. That's right. And that part of you is responding. Mm -hmm. And it's interesting that when you say that, that 
many people who can respond to the things I'm saying are what I call greater community people. They have a natural inclination towards understanding space. Anything having to do with space attracts them. Maybe as children, they drew pictures of stars or spaceships or anything with space has an attraction. There's something about space that speaks to them that doesn't speak to other people. And so for people who have this innate interest and orientation, I think this is important. I think this is a real clue as to who you are in the world at this time under these conditions. And you know, speaking of intervention, intervention is an absolutely major force in the whole evolution of civilization. Nations have been intervening with each other the whole way, with all, usually with awful results, but that's just a process of how the world has woven itself together through intervention. Sometimes not violent intervention, sometimes it's economic intervention, there's more economic intervention in these times, but intervention is a part of life. It's competition for resources, what's basic. I mean, the animals in the field are dealing with that. So this is competition for resources, in this case, the value of this world, at a larger level. So now we're taking a natural part of nature and evolution and we're bringing it into a larger arena. This is not some foreign reality. I mean, we've been learning how to compete with each other all the way. We've been learning about the real reality and history of intervention through our own history. Intervention is part of life. Big companies take over little companies. People over take over other people. I mean, it's so this is just happening on a bigger scale. Mm -hmm. And we are the native peoples of this world. However we may view each other, we are one race in one world. And there's no one else like us out there, really like us. So that should be food for thought right there. If we don't bond together, we're going to lose this world. And we're going to lose it by forces that we barely even recognize. We think an intervening force is a grand armada of ships are going to come and just destroy the place. No, it's not how things work in the universe. Advanced races don't do that. That's why they're advanced. The power of persuasion. And we're in a very vulnerable place right now, culturally, economically, environmentally. People are very nervous. People are looking for answers. People are distressed. I mean, you can see it in the face of people everywhere you go. I mean, it's palpable. So we're bringing the lesson of life into a larger arena. And when you look at it like that, it's not quite so alien or foreign. It's just happening at a different scale. And, you know, for you people can look to their own past, you know, what really got you unstuck, got you out of a situation or a dilemma or a poor position in life? Uh -huh. Often it's a calling to rise above it in some way, to, yes. to see it in a different light, a That's bigger right. light, to just depart it and do something else with your life that was calling to you. And so I, it's almost like, you know, this, hmm. this is an opportunity for the whole human race to respond to something that mm -hmm. has nothing to do with the neighboring country mm -hmm. or the other people who wronged your ancestors long ago right. or That's right. and, and all the cascading oh, levels of endless. fixation and conflict, which we are mired in. I mean, you look at the world today, it is it is a quagmire of conflict. That's right. And so instead of climbing in and, and trying to rectify every conflict out there, this is another route. Mm -hmm. This is another way is yeah. to respond to the presence of the universe beyond us, yeah. which reframes what it means to be a member of this human race. Mm -hmm. It reframes even who your own sense of self. That's right. And so it's kind of deep and, and also and, and powerful in what it can do, even though it is overwhelming and very challenging. Yeah. Um, but well, well, anything big is overwhelming. I mean, being overwhelmed is just the first, your first response to anything big. So, I mean, it's, of course, you're overwhelmed. I give you all space to be overwhelmed, it's fine. But you have to get beyond that to become determined and to, you know, face things. This is a this is such a great thing because the only way we can emerge into this universe of intelligent life, and that's our destiny, we have to we have to become a real race in the universe, and we can't do that as a warring tribe of religious warfare and political warfare and resource warfare, and you know. <laughs> We'll never survive the greater community. It will overtake us sooner or later, and we'll just fall under someone else's dominance, uh, which would be probably unbelievably tragic for us. And 
you know, it takes something this big to unite us. And the universe is not a friendly, happy place. It's very competitive. May not be warlike in our region of space. Very competitive. And if you're foolish or you're weak, or you're self-indulgent, you're not going to last very long. And also, if you're, if you're aggressive, if you're destructive, you don't last very long. In a network of a thousand trading worlds, one world wants to do war on their local region of space, they're going to be confronted by everyone else. Check and balance is huge in a situation like that. And we don't know anything about that. We don't know anything about the universe, except maybe some kind of physical dynamics. And I will say that what has been revealed to me through higher sources gives us a window into this universe. It's incredibly practical, real, and understandable. It doesn't mean that we understand life beyond our world, but we understand that life beyond the world is like life here. You know, the rules of the game are the same. The specter of the game, the diversity of the game, the complexity is much bigger, of course. But if we're, if we're not united, we're not going to make it in the universe. And we'll lose our freedom for sure. Guaranteed. So this is our opportunity to take a different tact. And... We can't expect other people to do that. It's only the people who can respond can be the forerunners of this. So you can't get your family to come to agreement with you. That's hopeless. You can't get your friends to unite with you in your understanding. That's hopeless. It's you, and you will reach other people who are of like mind. And that's why you know, a worldwide network of people who are aware of the intervention understand it and realize how they should respond to it. And much of my work is about how to respond to the intervention. And it's very similar to how to respond to the challenges of life. By following a deeper strength within you and by allowing your mind to be, become free of all the social programming uh, that has shaped the way we see ourselves and each other from day one. To gain freedom from that, enough freedom from that, that we can see clearly and be able to discern things we need to do and have the power to do them. Such a simple formula, but so difficult. When you're bound and hindered by the forces around you, the social forces, the family forces, the religious beliefs, that you literally cannot do what is natural for you to do. Yeah. You know, Marshall, in, in preparation for this conversation today, I went back to some of your earliest works. Uh -huh. um, not the earliest, but one of the most important being the book Preparing for the Greater Community. And, you know, on the back cover of that book is a passage from the book itself. And it says something like, our world is emerging into a greater community of worlds. And for this, we are unprepared. Uh -huh. This is the preparation. Yeah. And I think in, in many ways that kind of sums up the heart and essence yeah. of what brought your work into being. And, and I'm curious, how do you view that now? What, what is, what is this emergence what is this preparation? You know, what's the essence of that, of that uh -huh. process? Uh -huh. For the individual, especially. Well, this has to begin with the individual. I mean, we're reached, the divine reaches us individually and activates us individually. Many people have already been activated. They're feeling restless about being in the world. Something's happening. I don't know where we're going. I'm unsettled. Uh, I'm uncomfortable. And I see this as a sign of being stirred by some, something greater and innate within us. And it's uncomfortable, but it's also important. Because if you're just blindly going through your life thinking everything is fine or it's not my problem, you're checked out. You're, you're, almost, you're not being intelligent and you're not responding to your environment. And so I think the power to hold a challenging focus is really strengthening. You don't have answers. You don't know how it's going to work. Nobody at the beginning of something big knows how it's going to work. Nobody's assured of success. That's ridiculous. You have to go into life willing to participate in life and learn how to be in life. And we are in the process of merging out of isolation in the universe. We're never going to have it again. Even if we were to overcome this wave of intervention, there'll be others. And we're going to, a free nation does not exist well easily amongst larger nations that are not free. You see that in our own world. Free nations are under a lot of pressure from nations that are not free. So 
We, if we're going to be a free and self-determined people in the universe, we're going to have to learn the lessons that are challenging us right now. Mm-hmm. This, this is our learning ground. This is our ground. This is our, you know, ground training in how to be in the universe. It's how to deal with those forces that are from the universe in our world today. Mm-hmm. And that's a personal responsibility. And I'm very pleased that I can at least contribute things that will help people to do that in a meaningful way. <clears throat> Otherwise, we will succumb to our own internal dilemmas and our conflicts with one another. I mean, it's just sooner or later, particularly as the world becomes harder to live in and deprivation increases. So I, <clears throat> I think this is our moment. And it's not just a moment because we need to play in a long game. This is not about reaching goals next year or a five-year plan. We've got to be with this the whole way. Or our, we're going to give our children a world of utter desperation and tragedy. And if you have kids, I'm telling you, I'm sure you're already concerned about that to some degree, probably. <clears throat> so this is a time for us to become alert, aware, and be able to connect with others who are now becoming alert and aware naturally. I mean, this is just a network, a knowledge network, if you will or people who are responding to this and are being able to be able to see it clearly for what it is. You know, I've been on ra- many radio interviews where all the speculation about the, the presence, is all it could be and should be, and it's connected to this and it's connected to that. And I've said to some of my hosts, I said, sir, can't you just see this for what it is? And they're like, you're dumbfounded. Because their whole game is about creating diversity of opinion and keeping this a mystery and having it be what everybody thinks it could be and where everybody's got an opinion, rather than, can I just see this and notice what it is? The yeah, behavior of the intervention absolutely tells you it's an intervention. Its activities tell you it's destructive to humanity. And yet, of course, you know, the simple truth is often the hardest, right? Because hardest. When, tr- when the truth is simple, then you have to act. You have to do something. And often in life, I mean, yeah, life has a lot of complexity, but its overall movement, you could say, is simple. The problem, though, is that all of a sudden you find yourself an actor on that stage. Yeah. And do you really want to be an actor yeah. on that stage? Simple is difficult. <laughs> right. You know, people sometimes get together and talk about these things and kind of get jazzed up on, you know, alien presence in the world and what it could mean and what it could do. And But they're just, they're just sitting in the audience. They're not paying attention. They're not asking the critical questions. What is I need to know about this? This is not so complex. This is an act of nature. We've been through it countless times in this world. Can't I just see this and know this for what it is? Doesn't mean you can understand it or understand what it's doing. No, just what is it? If we have an intruder in a house, that's an intruder. That's a simple truth. Demanding right. immediate action. Doesn't mean you know who the intruder is, why they're there, what they're going to do. I have an intruder in my house. You know, our first uh, live stream a few weeks, actually a couple months ago, was um, was on the topic of why the world needs you. And I, I, mm. I flash back to that topic because this is why. You know, this topic of such a simple truth about contact, the intervention, but such a challenging truth. Right. And why does the world need you? This is why the right. world needs you. Because who is responding to this? Right. That's right. Well, and actually, many people are responding. You could say hundreds of millions but at a level beneath their conscious awareness. Mm -hmm. They're responding at the level of, you could say, knowledge or spirit, like their being is responding, Mm -hmm. A, because their being is connected to the future of the world. Mm -hmm. This is the future of the world, Mm -hmm. is to emerge into this universe of life. Um, And also their being holds purpose, and purpose is action in service to real needs. Mm -hmm. This is, you could say, the big need behind all the other needs. There's many needs in the world, many issues that are worth supporting, and this is the one behind all of them yeah. that yes. absolutely has to be. Well, if this had resolved, that. everything else we do in service to the world will probably fail in the future at some point. Mm-hmm. So the intervention is sowing seeds of discontent and dissension and opposition within our cultures, within the minds of many people. It's trying to convince people it and nothing else will save us from our dilemmas. 
and that it has a key to our spiritual fulfillment and to our future success. It's a great narrative. They're not doing anything to demonstrate that, but that's what people want to hear. So this is this is a wake up call, and it's not an easy one. And I respect anybody who can even begin to walk around this. I'm not asking you to believe everything I'm saying, but I am asking you, no matter what your viewpoint is on the subject, even if you have a viewpoint, to walk around this and consider the things I'm saying today. If we don't get this right, we're going to fail. That's my prediction. And I, I think a lot of people feel the possibility of failure, even as a race. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. And there's a lot of depression around that. And so I think this is an opportunity to respond positively yeah. to what has the power to cause failure yeah. as a world and as, as, a, as a human well, being. You, we can only unite over great, greater overriding needs, you know, because every country has its own needs and can be in con competition with the needs of another race, another country. But um, overriding needs are the only thing that we can really unite over because we all will suffer the consequences if we don't, mm -hmm. you know. In our next live stream, we're going to be talking about the state of the world. And, of course, one of the big things happening in the world is a major land war in Europe, mm -hmm. which seems intractable and without any sort of resolution. But when you talk about core needs, right, mm -hmm. I mean, how would unity ever be achieved, really? Well, maybe nothing less. Maybe yeah. nothing less than losing sovereignty over the planet itself. Maybe that's the only thing that could ever bring these two parties back. It, it's so hard for people. It's so incredible. It's so out of the outside the box of how they think and what they think life is. Um, but, you know, life happens whether we're ready or not. Things don't happen at the perfect time for us. They happen. And we're either there for it or we're not. So this is this is the biggest thing happening in the world today. But it's off most people's screens. The government, the part of the government that knows about it isn't talking, and everybody are all over the place about how they, if they're aware of it at all, how they understand it or try to tie it into their religious beliefs or their social ideas. But this is, uh, this has really power of redemption if you can respond. If you can live without answers, because when you have a higher purpose in life, it's not a higher purpose of having answers. It's a higher purpose that sets a direction in your life and you follow that direction and things begin to come together for you. Not because you you have some great answers. Answers are nothing. You know, life is about movement. It's about action. It's about what you do and why you do it. And your good ideas are like water under the bridge, you know. So I bring challenge. I bring purpose. I bring the possibility of real redemption and greater unity in sharing this with you, and perhaps through you to others as well. Yeah, so I'm very happy sure. to share this with you. Thank you for being with us in this important event, and I look forward to speaking with you again. Yeah, we'll be back on air in a few weeks' time, mm -hmm. and um, we're going to continue this conversation. I mean, we're not just here to talk about this. Marshall, I work with Marshall, Marshall and I, and those with us, our organization, and our, our core community here, we're about taking this action. We're about movement in light of all of this. So that's what we're about. And we hope you can feel that. Uh, we hope you're up for it. Because <laughs> if not, you, you may not be able to hang on for too long. Because uh, we're, we're all about heading out and doing what we feel we know we need to do in light of all this at the level of our personal lives. And I, I think that's really where we'll, we'll, we'll go later on in our broadcast with you is, is what can you do in your personal life? What is the nature of... What is the nature of response to all of this big stuff? Because it has to come home to the daily life, the weekly life, the life that's right in front of you. So thank you so much for being here. I appreciate your presence. And I'm sure this brings up a lot. And um, there are ways to contribute that. We have uh, a community site where you can join and, and get connected with others in that knowledge network like Marshall described. And we have other gatherings and events up ahead. Um, I do want to share with you um, a few links to Marshall's channels where you can hear more from Marshall. He's got a lot up online. So there's his Twitter, his Facebook, and his YouTube accounts. 
Um, and then also in a few weeks' time, I'll be um, bringing forward one of Marshall's earlier works. Uh, and we have that up on screen as well. So that'll be a live stream of a never-before-heard teaching. And this is called Experiencing Your Higher Purpose, uh, which is very much in light of the state of the world and our emergence into this larger universe. So thank you so much for being here. We look forward to seeing you at the next live on-air conversation about the present state of our world and how people can begin to make a contribution to the world at the level of their deeper nature going forward. So thank you once again for being here and we'll see you next time.